Commercial Drones FM is brought to you by FLIR Delta. Delta is the definitive source for thermal drone knowledge, best practices, and training. Go to FLIR.com slash Delta and get started now. Welcome to CommercialDrones.fm, the podcast that explores the commercial drone industry, the people who power it, and the concepts that drive it. I'm your host, Ian Smith. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Commercial Drones FM. Ian here, and I'm sitting in Chicago, Illinois at Exponential with David Hose. He's the CEO of AirMap. Welcome to the show, David. Thank you, Ian. Thank you for being here. I've been doing the podcast since 2016, and I've never had AirMap on the show. So this is a really good moment for me and for the industry to have you on. So it's great to really have you here to give your opinions and your background and that's actually where I want to start. So you're not from, you don't have a background in drones, but tell us like, where do you come from? How did you get here? And, and how did you become the CEO of AirMap? That's a bit of a journey. I uh, started out as a software engineer a long time ago, like 1980, before you were born. <laughs> Very presumptuous of you, David. Yeah, well, you're, you're looking good. You're, you're looking good today. <laughs> Thank you. So yeah, started out writing software and um, in maps, a lot of things in the mapping industry. Ended up from there, went and did things in the nine one one. So GIS systems, background, a lot of GIS nice. for sure, and uh, then ended up in the mobile phone industry doing things there, and just kept on going uh, a bunch of different things over time. But through that. Got to know some of the people that were involved in AirMap. And in fact, when um, one of the investors put some money into AirMap, they called me up and said, this thing's hot. This is a very cool, uh, you know, just great idea. It's a big industry. You should pay attention. But I was busy, so I didn't. Then they called me back again. And uh, Ben and I talked uh, about my joining as a CEO, and here's where I am. Been here for about a year now. Gotcha. And yeah, that's right. So Ben Marcus was founder, I don't know if it was co-founder, yeah, co-founder, founder, founder, right? co-founder of AirMap. And then so you kind of took the reins. And actually, I've seen this happen. Well, Michael Chasen, who was just in the in the room, he took over from the original founders of Precision Hawk. Then there was a gentleman who's also been on the podcast from Kespri, who took the reins over uh, George Matthew from the original founder. I think his name was Paul in Kespri. So it seems to be a thing. Um, you're from California originally, or are you yeah, based there? Grew okay. up in Southern California. So you've been around the venture capital, all that stuff. This is a common thing then for companies like to transition from original founder to someone probably with more experience going after and like scaling it out and then like growing things pretty big. You know, it does happen all the time. Of course, you also have the stories where someone came in and carried it all the way to the end. And it, mm-hmm. a lot of it's just what people are interested in, what they like to spend their time on, what they're good at. And, you, you know, if those get out of whack in any business, after a while, it's like, well, why don't you bring in somebody that, you know, likes to do the things that, you know, in this case, a CEO of a business at our scale at this time uh, needs to pay attention to. And uh, I get to do some fun things like talk to you, but there's, uh, <laughs> and I know Ben that's good at that, uh, but there are other parts of the business that I go focus on that yeah. I'm good at. Cool. So tell us a little bit about AirMap then. Like the way I know AirMap is like... <laughs> I don't know when I first, I'm just looking back, like, so I entered drones in early 2013, and I remember being very concerned about airspace. My ba- I'm a commercial helicopter pilot, used to fly manned aviation a lot, and I remember being very concerned about the airspace when no one else really was. And I was like, guys, this is we got to be very safe, very serious here, and it was still like the super wild, wild west. I don't think AirMap had like a product yet, and I was looking at aviation sectionals, VFR sectionals to see, like, make sure I was not in the airspace um, of an airport. And I think probably software, the software piece and the APIs, and obviously we've got DJI here who had the big hardware stuff. They have a lot of software too, but their proliferation of that hardware and then marriage in the software with the GPS units on board were allowed, I guess, a company like AirMap to create these solutions where well, tell us what the solutions are. <laughs> I'm no. not going to do all the work for yeah, you. Yeah, <laughs> no, absolutely. Well, I think what you're bringing up in your history and the way that you came to the drone industry is a good way to think through AirMap. Because you know aviation. You're a commercial helicopter pilot, right? So you know about reading the maps. You go online and figure out what the rules are. You study, you pass the test, you fly a lot, right? All of that, right? And the aviation industry, you know, they published all those same kinds of things for drones. 
But the people that buy the drones off of the internet or wherever, they get their drone, they unbox the drone, they take the drone out, and they they don't look at any of those rules, mm. and they start flying, right? <laughs> I know I did, because I bought my yeah. drone, and I did that. I mean, right? everybody did. It's like, yeah, it just happened. And so in each drone that's sold now, or at least DJI complies, they put like, hey, make sure you check the airspace, like all this stuff about like safety and everything. So part of the you know, the innovation that Greg McNeil and, and Ben Marcus, who co-founded the business here, was to say, well, hey, well, why don't we take these aerospace regulations and the maps and let's put them into a computerized, easily consumed, easy to understand way so that, you know, smart technical people that can use their mobile phone, they can also figure this out and they don't have to be trained commercial pilots to do it. So that was the first innovation, and I think the you know digitizing the map, taking something that says, "Well, you can't fly over a federal prison, right?" And then go and find all the federal prisons. And what does it mean <laughs> yeah. not to fly over it, and all of that? That was the genesis of AirMap, right? That's what got them going, and and the partnership with DJI to try to figure out how to combine that software and hardware, and uh, some of the other companies at the time was the beginning of AirMap. Do you get to use your GIS background like practice? I mean, I know you're like your CEO, so you're not going to get in all the nuts and bolts and stuff. But is it cool to like I don't know, just be working with maps and stuff? Well, that was a that was a huge attraction to me. Right, yeah. I thought this. Uh, so it is fun. I love that. You know, I remember. You know, this is one of the things that's exciting to me about the drone industry is that I've been through other industries from the beginning. If you can imagine, in the early '80s, I was like, "Wow, you could have digital maps, and <laughs> what are all the things you could do with digital maps?" Right, and I was just, you know, it was so exciting to work in an area like that. And now, looking back and seeing it, uh, all the things that have done with that. I know the same is happening with drones, mm. and so it's fantastic to be part of this industry where we're in the early days of what's going to be a hugely impactful new industry, right? Speaking of love for maps, I just I don't know why I thought of this, but if you're on Reddit, there's an awesome subreddit called Map Porn. It's our <laughs> Reddit. It's so worth it because like there's amazing maps on there that people. Some are cartographers, some are hobbyists, some draw them freehand. Uh, it's just such a cool subreddit. So if you're listening to this and you love maps like us, check out Reddit.com/r/slash map porn. I love it. Oh, <laughs> it's there great. Go. I'm, it's I'm good on it. map stuff. So you guys have a few products. I'm familiar with. The drone pilots one. So I use, like, okay, globally, if I'm going somewhere and I need to know and I'm going to fly my drone, I usually go on the internet first. Like, if I'm not already in the field, I go to AirMap is where I go. So full disclosure, I'm like an AirMap user over here. I also have, and that's one of the, it's not just on the web. You guys have an app as well. So I'm a user of of that part. That's AirMap for drone pilots. I'm going down kind of like your product list. You've got AirMap UTM, which I want to touch on, unmanned traffic management, then the AirMap developer platform, which I'm also familiar with. A lot of people may know I worked at Drone Deploy for many, many years, and I was kind of leading the charge and led the charge with the AirMap and Drone Deploy integration, which saw millions of API calls uh, over the time that I was there, and it continues to, I'm sure, with just the AirMap integration into other software. And so software background you have, how important is it <laughs> for these APIs and, and integrating into everything for you guys just for as AirMap, like that type of integration with Drone Deploy? It's critical. I mean, we believe that this is an industry that, yes, there's some big players, but at the end of the day, you're going to have all kinds of different drones, all kinds of mission planners, all kinds of you know fleet management systems, just all kinds of software that need the information that AirMap provides. And so whether it is the contextual airspace of of can I fly here based on the mission that I'm doing, uh, or whether it's uh, some of the more advanced things we offer like uh, manned traffic feeds or the weather, elevation, and now um, the locations of other drones, those features are run in our cloud and they're available to developers to innovate with in whatever context they have. Mm. And so drone deploy uses some functions in the system. We have, you know, if you're doing a more advanced mission like the Matternet uh, drone delivery with UPS down in North Carolina, where they're delivering blood samples between hospitals and testing centers, right? They use these, you know, the APIs of the AirMap SDK for to support that mission. Gotcha, gotcha. And you guys used to be integrated as like the 
back end. I don't know what to call it. There was a DJI and AirMap integration for airspace. It no longer is there. Instead, it's Precision Hawk. Can you give us a little background, maybe, of kind of like what happened with that situation? Yeah, with well, the, we with we, the DJI. We, you know, that was a very early. You know, uh, SDK user was DJI. We worked a lot together. You know, before my time, but I know that. That it was the you know Geo 1.0 for them to give them the you know, the ability to give you restrictions and in some cases require that you have to unlock in order to fly in in a place right you know so you don't like accidentally or even maybe purposely you know fly your drone on the White House lawn <laughs> so that was uh, work that we did together based on our cloud based system using our SDK. You know, over time, we upgraded our SDK, and at some point, DJI wanted to upgrade as well. And when they did that, they decided to go with Precision Hawk here in the U.S., and then later with some other players in other parts of the world. It was just a business decision by DJI. Yeah. Your coverage, though, is global, like airmap.com. If I go on there, I can get coverage pretty much everywhere. Well, I would imagine... Most countries, I don't want to say like every single country and every city and municipality and all the little airspace like stuff, but like the mission is to be global. Absolutely. And okay. and we do that. And uh, this is, you know, something that when people ask, what is it that AirMap is um, investing in? We invest a lot in the data. So around the world, we pull together the airports and the, the facility maps uh, from the sources we can get them from. And then we fill that in with additional sources of information. We go through the regulations across the world and understand them. And when they change, like they did recently in the UK, we go through and update all of our data and get that out to the users. So it's a crazy difficult job. Mm. And we can't do this highest level of quality everywhere in the world. (laughs) And in particular today, you know, we offer all of that for free. Right. Our Air Maps for Drones app is a free app all around it. the world, right? Mm. And so, like uh, everyone, like Google, who gives search away for free, we need a business <laughs> model. Ours may not be the same as theirs, yeah. but ultimately, uh, the business model will need to fund the continued development of that map as we make it more and more accurate, as it changes all the time, as the regulations change, we keep investing in that. And so, yes, all around the world. So you'll find places like Japan where it's highly accurate because we're doing quite Mm. a bit in Japan, most of Western Europe, uh, of course, the U.S., and uh, a number of other countries around the world. We have pretty accurate data. If you look at the whole, the overall strategy of AirMap, like looking forward further on, I feel my inclination is to assume that drones are just going to be kind of a piece of it, like there's a lot of air traffic out there that's not just drones. There's going to be new air traffic, urban air mobility, EV toll aircraft, Airbus is working on it, Bell's working on it, everybody's working on it <laughs> almost. Is that part of the strategy? Are you guys looking into like in the future being able to support that? I mean, obviously with the UTM, so the unmanned traffic management platform, to me, I feel like that could eventually just become an air traffic control for everything. But what are your thoughts on that? Am I on the right track here? Well, I think over time, the automation of the airspace is the driver for AirMap and our UTM and all the people trying to define and implement a UTM. Think of the UTM as, I mean, when people ask me, what are you doing now? I I say, well, we're building an air traffic control for drones. Just simple, easy to understand. What that is, is still got a a long road ahead, but fundamentally it's all about automation. Mm-hmm. You know, where AirMap, the world that we live today, where drones are piloted by people and that most of the missions are visual line of sight, but the world that we are building towards is the one where it'll be automated flights because they're safe and there'll be a whole set of services that mm-hmm. uh, you need for that, right? You're going to need to know, of course, what the weather's like and what the regulations are to fly in this area and do I have the credentials and have I been validated and now I'm flying and is anyone else going to fly near my area? I need to know about them. Oh, something happened, so I need to divert. Where, where can I divert, mm-hmm. right? And how do I do it in a way that's safe? This combination of the sets of services that in today's manned aircraft world are handled between the air traffic control and the pilot Mm -hmm. are the things we're automating in UTM. 
And now, a quick word from our sponsors. Today's episode is brought to you by KittyHawk.io, the enterprise solution for drone operations management, available on the web, iOS, Android, and DJI's Crystal Sky. Operating a successful commercial drone program doesn't have to involve a ton of tools and time making them talk to each other. With Kitty Hawk, you can manage your aircraft, operators, and airspace all from a single unified platform. Managers can use Kitty Hawk to monitor their fleet, assign missions, and effortlessly track compliance. Your pilots fly in the Kitty Hawk app with safety and compliance settings that you customize based on your company's needs. There's even an API to make integrating Kitty Hawk into your workflows easy and automatic. Visit kittyhawk.io to learn more. Skywatch.ai is a leading drone safety and insurance solution, providing inclusive, flexible, and affordable coverage for commercial drone pilots, from single operators to enterprise users. Protect your business, drone, and equipment by obtaining Skywatch AI's liability and physical damage coverage, either with an hourly or a monthly plan. Skywatch AI's hourly plan allows you to get insurance on the spot for a specific job at an affordable price. The monthly plan lets you fly with peace of mind, with complete liability and physical damage coverage that you can change as needed. Additionally, as a safe pilot, you can save up to 50% on your premiums just by flying safely over time. Download the Skywatch.ai app through the App Store, Google Play, and the Drone Deploy app market and get drone insurance that's tailored to your needs. Okay, back to the show. I definitely see this future for sure. And what do you think then? So there's a lot of talk about UT. I mean, there's almost too much talk for my... <laughs> it, it always comes up. It's the same thing. Beyond visual line of sight, UTM, remote ID, flying over people, flying at night, all the things we can't do. Do you have any thoughts about remote ID? Like has AirMap participated in any of the... What was it? There was like a council on it. Like there was something that was a decision made like a long time ago. I was just hearing Brandon Schulman from DJI talking about it on a panel on Monday. But uh, do you guys have big opinions on remote ID or like any technology and how that works? Or what are your thoughts on that, I guess, just generally? Absolutely. We have a lot of thoughts and we've done quite a bit of things in different places in the world, including more recently showing uh, together with Wing and Kitty Hawk a demonstration of what is network-based remote ID. Mm. The way to think about it, if somebody's connected to my UTM system, they're flying their drone and, and they're sending us their telemetry so we know where they're flying then we can collaborate with other UTM systems that yeah. are maybe supporting other drones in the same area. like say, Inter-USS right? is, I think, what they're calling it. Yeah. Exactly. And then talk back and forth and, and then use that information to be able to know exactly who's in the area. Mm-hmm. And in the case of the demonstrations we did, we could say, oh, that's somebody who's supposed to be there, right? Yeah, it's really interesting. I had actually um, Adi Singh. He mm-hmm. was at Ford believe it or not. And they were they have a drone arm in Silicon Valley, like down in the valley somewhere. I forget where it is. Oh, it's near where Theranos was, mm. I think, actually. Oh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's a good spot, a town. Anyways, Adi's not with Ford anymore. He was a guest. It must have been over a year ago. It was definitely over a year ago. And it was the method in which remote ID is implemented is still kind of being like, what is the best way? And they actually had a really interesting, I'm just like kind of hearkening back to a simpler time (laughs) where like it still, it seems so simple and on the verge of like being implemented, but they had a system where like if they had like some payload uh, that could connect with the flight controller, just basically, let's just imagine a DJI drone having their code on it or whatever the agreed upon code was. And a consumer app with using the camera on the phone could point up at a drone if you're on the ground. This was basically for like regular denizens of the world. And they could point up at a drone they saw. And then the drone is actually always flashing a series of lights that it's imperceptible to us. But the app can decode it and tell you who owns the drone. I mean, it's just, it is, remote ID is so interesting and there's so many ideas on how it could work and what it could like how it could actually culminate in reality and that one I don't think is going to get chosen it does it is really cool and I was like very impressed uh, that they were working on that but anyways it's just I hope something comes out soon I love the inter USS stuff that you guys are doing with Wing and Kitty Hawk uh, it makes a ton of sense cuz there will be different systems out there to use well, it's, a, it's a huge challenging problem. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm glad that there's this emphasis from the FAA and industry on remote ID. You know, I recognize that both 
the technologies to support remote ID are, it's hard to get a one size fits all solution. You know, if you do what we were working with, with uh, Wing and Kitty Hawk, you need to be in a, in some kind of a place where you can have communications and a network. And, and there are parts of the world that you don't have communications and a network. Mm. I recognize that sometimes people just want to know, like, well, what, who is that? Can I get a license plate for the drone? And in other cases, they want to be able to use this remote ID so that the automated systems can talk to each other and know who's in the right place. Yeah. It's hard to find one size fits all technical solution. And there are a myriad of different applications that people think the remote ID are going to solve. And so uh, I think the FAA is doing a, a great job of trying to organize this, prioritize things so that they can create some rulemaking. I know it's not simple, but uh, I'm hopeful that you know, we'll progress along their timeline. Totally agree. Definitely not simple. So many different options out there and so many uh, variables to account for. I've got some listener questions. I asked the Commercial Drones FM community and I said, hey, we've got David Ho, CEO of Aramath coming on. You got any questions for him? So we got a few here. And I will read these and I'll do my best to like paraphrase them so that they're more <laughs> intelligible read aloud than just like reading like short form text here. This is something that people scratch their heads. They're wondering what the official stance here is from AirMap. Regrettably or admittedly, I don't know all the details on this, and I didn't pay attention too much when this was happening. But basically, from what I understand, there was a time when AirMap gave their support for more like minute community-based regulation like versus like more like federal hey there's a whole like there's rules for the airspace all over uh, the US and they're all going to be the same or like every little community can kind of make their own and then i guess upload those rules into airmap and so one of the listeners was saying you know he's curious why and he's he just gave the example he said well imagine i'm trying to conduct business in a DFW there's over 175 different municipalities and each having their own laws how's that going to work if i'm going across little municipality borders and stuff so yeah any color or light you can shed on that would be very helpful for the drone community. Yeah, well, I, look, this is a hot topic for people, and I think there's it's been a lot of history and a lot of um, a lot of noise around it. So it's almost one like you know, people don't listen, but hopefully you'll listen because let me tell you what is going on. Turn up the volume. Yeah. So uh, first, this was all motivated by Ben and Greg thinking of the future of drones, much like I did when I was dreaming about maps and all these things could happen with digital maps. But you know, so you just think about what's the future going to be, and what they realize is that. Well, they imagined a future that was going to be like one of these movies where drones are flying all over the place, all you know, doing all kinds of things. And they recognized that, well, when that happens, there's going to be all kinds of local situations. A simple example might be, today there's a parade here, or um, they're doing construction somewhere, or who knows what it might be. But a tremendous amount of local activities that would impact drone operations in some fashion. And if you look at a world of automation and you realize that, well, where's all that going to come from? And remember, AirMap was in the middle of gathering this data all around the world to put the regulations in an automated way. Mm -hmm. And so their view was, we need local involvement. How are we going to have these automated drones flying all over the place? Is the FAA going to like create the master map of everywhere in the entire world, right? <laughs> or the United yeah. States? And the view was, well, that's impossible. So the local people need to participate. Right, mm. and of course, then you get to some of the other concerns that could. If you again, if you imagine this future, and you say, "Well, what else is going to happen?" Well, hey, some people uh, might be concerned about privacy. Right, they may not want a drone to fly right by their house and hover there and look at them. <laughs> right, or some people might want that. Actually, there's, there's some of those maybe they're going to be. Those are the people <laughs> that will be on. Uh, what was the map Reddit? Oh, map porn. Map porn. <laughs> maybe related to that. So that's where the kind of the catalyst of the concern is yeah. when we get to full automation, how do we get a you know, fully complete map? And that's where it came from. Now, it got manifested in people. When you try to turn that into reality, you just, then it was like, well, okay, well, then did the local people, do they, what kinds of regulations can they make? And, you know, in today's world, right, you can't take off or land without a local authority in our world. But once you take off, the FAA is responsible. Mm. So moving from that 
particular thing to a future where this is all addressed has been a lot of ideas came up. I think AirMap had some ideas. Other people in the industry had ideas. I'd say some of our ideas were good. Some of them probably weren't good. But we were just spitballing things, trying to figure out mm. what was going to, how to solve this. Yeah. And, but we did that through this prism of, and this vision that, you know, technology can do a lot. And I think if you look today and say, probably the best way to describe how we think the world should happen in the future is the Lance program. Mm -hmm. So if you've used Lance, so I imagine you have, yep. right, through the yep. AirMap app, right? You, yeah. You basically, you know, you start your flight and flight plan and you lay it all out Super and it slick. turns around and says, oh, you know, you're flying too high, you're going to get rejected. Mm -hmm. Or you're going to, this one will take a manual authorization, right? Yeah. <laughs> or here, you just do it. Right? Exactly. So if you can imagine, in our vision is that you get the map in, whatever the rules and regulations are, those are in the system, you know, whoever is responsible for them, and then you do something as simple as Lance. You just say, I'm going to fly this way, and it comes back and says, okay, you got the automated approval. Right? Yeah. So it was a combination, of, you know, it's a little bit of a long explanation here, but it's a combination of, hey, the world's going to get really complicated when you have lots of drones flying, you need the local intelligence, and we know that technology can do things that just make it really simple. Yeah. So that's our vision is, let's put those two things together. And we're a long road, there's a lot of rule making that needs to happen. At this point, AirMap's view is, can you make the rules? <laughs> right? <laughs> can uh, we just have some type of progress here? I always have to play the devil's advocate. There's reasons for everything and every kind of decision and stance, and I believe that it can evolve too, and especially based on a lot of passionate feedback from an entire community, that can absolutely change things. So appreciate the extra information there. I hope that satisfies the listeners. Um, if you have more questions or comments, direct them over to me, and I'll do my best to uh, follow up. Uh, with David and and shed more light on this if need be. Now, with that said, so there's more questions here. So do you see there being a pay-to-play model in controlled airspace approvals? So I guess in this scenario, it would kind of be like Lance, like paying yeah, for that, Lance. that's an example. I think the, well, that it does exist. You know, AirMap's app today is free mm -hmm. and Lance is free. Uh, there are other people that offer Lance, but they only offer it as sort of part of another program they have to pay for. Mm. Or they let you do some, but you know, if you want to do more than a certain amount, you pay for. I think that's not really the ultimate value. The value for a drone operator is the set of services that allow them to perform their mission. So I do believe that if you're flying an advanced mission and you need to know, you know what the elevation is for this and what the weather's going to be and if there's other things on your route and, and you're going to want to be informed if something changes. Sets of services like that, maybe over time, like where would you land in an emergency or what's the best route for me to fly, those sets of services together will be things people pay for. Mm. But the people that pay for it will be primarily commercial operators that see this as a tool to mm -hmm. allow them to complete their mission. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there's going to be options. Like, let's be honest. I don't think it's going to be a one size, like, fits the whole world, the industry kind of scenario here. Here's another one. Where, <laughs> where do you see this Gartner hype cycle comes up all the time, but where do you see the drone services market? So people trying to do drone services on the Gartner hype cycle curve. I guess that's the whole industry anyways. I mean, we're all kind of in it together. Are you familiar with the Gartner hype cycle? I mean, I, look, I'll go first. <laughs> I think we're in the trough. Um, although I'm probably on air saying that like at least two years ago too, but it could just kind of seems like, yeah, there's been a little bit of a slowdown and a little bit of a stall and we're kind of coasting right now. I would wish we were accelerating. But my opinion on this like is like, sure, we're in the trough, but everybody knows what happens after the trough. And I don't know what the hell it's called, but it's probably <laughs> going up and to the right. So what do you think about it, David? I'd say that, you know, look, part of this is probably because I come in recently into the market, but uh, the market's growing. This is a market that continues to grow. Drone sales are growing. The overall uh, drone services market's growing. The number of flights are growing. This is a market that's growing. Maybe not to the extent that people have wanted it or they thought they were going to grow before, but it is growing and it's continuing to grow. You know, if you step back and look at what we believe AirMap is focused on, at the end of the day, it's removing friction from people's ability to fly. 
we want to make it very easy to fly. Not only to know what the rules are, but to get the authorizations if you need them, and have the information you need in order to do these mm-hmm. flights. And I think that at the end of the day, it's the friction in the market that's what's really disappointing people. It's because there's a lot they could do, but you know it's hard. Yeah, right. I mean, totally the, agree. The FAA came back and said. We're proud that we've cut the waiver's approval cycle from 90 days to 45 days, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, Right? What we want is more of the Lance type of thing. Because in effect, Lance is a waiver. It's yeah. a type of waiver. It's very constrained, right? It's just around controlled airspace and you know, within the limits. But you get a waiver instantly. And our hope is that as we improve, I mean, really what we're driving to do from AirMap is to get the equivalent of Lance waivers instantly Mm -hmm. uh, as much as possible everywhere. Yeah. And I think as we do that, and and we're seeing it, as we do that, that removes this friction and a lot more flights happen. Like, it's all about perspective, uh, really. And you entered the drone industry after I did, for sure. And you have a different viewpoint on it because there still is growth and there's no denying that. It's not like shrinking or anything. Maybe the recurrent Part 107 pilot statistic is shrinking, but that doesn't actually necessarily mean that businesses aren't adopting more of this and that drone services aren't happening. But it is growing still for sure. And so I'm just a jaded old curmudgeon that's been in the industry for too long now, (laughs) talked to too many people and pontificated too much. But I digress. Um, <laughs> David, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show. I um, really appreciate you stopping by here at Exponential to come talk. Everyone, if you're listening and you want to learn more about AirMap, if you've never heard of them for some reason and don't know, it's airmap.com. Go visit airmap.com. Um, you can check out their blog from there, uh, see all their different products and ways to kind of use their air map for drone pilots and then their developer platform and also the UTM. You just heard David Hose, the CEO of AirMap. David, thank you so much again for coming. Thank you, Ian. Appreciate it. My pleasure. And we're going to cut off the mics. Cheers. Commercial Drones FM is supported by MicaSense. MicaSense develops drone-based sensors for agriculture. With hundreds of research publications, dozens of case studies, and customers in over 75 countries, MicaSense sensors are proven to increase yield and save your customers money. For more information on what a MicaSense sensor can help you achieve, visit micasense.com.